So for more targeted stroke, we're dealing with what is ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. TI is a type of ischemic stroke, which is like more reversible, um, die, uh, transient, uh, but more permanent with lasting damage would be ischemic stroke. And we have hemorrhagic stroke on the other on the other end of the spectrum. So how will I differentiate? How does ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke, how do they differ in terms of presentation? Um, I mean, of course, ischemic stroke is the, um, well, both of them are sudden, so time-wise doesn't really help us. However, in ischemic stroke, since there's no blood accumulating in the brain, there are no features of what increased intracranial pressure. So that's one thing that's important here. The patient has a focal nerve deficit, and I see no evidence of increased ICP. No headache, vomiting, papillary fever, neck stiffness, things like that. Right, likely ischemic, not hemorrhagic. Patient has oh, intact mental status, intact mentation, ischemic stroke. Patient with ischemic stroke, they have focal length deficit, but they are left oriented. Actually, it's not that severe. They are late oriented, they're still able to communicate, they are, um, they are not confused. But in hemorrhagic stroke, where there's going to be intracranial bleed, right, we might see evidence of what? Increased intracranial pressure. So these patients will have vomiting, nausea, papillary edema, headache, things like that. Are there. Okay, and there's likely blood accumulation in the brain. And then a patient do usually have what altered mental status. These people might be sleepy, comatose, yeah, confused, disoriented, things like that, yes. Then, of course, on imaging, if we given the imaging right, if, if we, in the ischemic stroke, there will be no uh, hemorrhage, right? there will be no bleed, no high-binding signal. So, image, CT or MRI, we show no bleed. If I'm dealing with ischemic stroke, why if it's hemorrhagic stroke, you're going to see some blood of bleed, CT, MRI can show blood. So based on presentation, I can start kind of have an idea to predict what type patient has. Uh, normal ICP, intact ventation, no bleed on imaging, likely ischemic. If it's something that resolves, the focal nerve deficit resolves continuously within 24 hours, I'm dealing with TIA. If not, it's definitely a stroke or a and um, if I see evidence of increased ICP, patient is confused, disoriented, blah, 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 there's blood on imaging, right? Likely hemorrhagic, right? Stroke. So, ischemic stroke, we can further divide based on the type of pathophysiology. We can divide ischemic stroke into embolic, thrombotic, and there's like lacuna, right? In fact, embolic stroke, thrombotic stroke, and uh, lacuna, in fact. Embolic stroke is basically a clot that is formed somewhere else, outside, right, the cerebral vessels or outside the carotid uh, vessels uh, that will travel right to the brain. So clot is formed somewhere else and it's going to travel to the brain. Thrombotic and lacuna in fact, the pathology itself is in the carotid or cerebral vessel, within the vessels that primarily supply the nervous system, where the pathology is. In embolic stroke, the pathology is somewhere else, outside the nervous system, right in the heart and the veins, etc. And then the clot dislodges, right, and then travels to the brain. So an embolic can also be paradoxical or cardiogenic. So the most common source of embolic stroke would definitely be the heart, cardiogenic stroke, which may be septic, Embolus. Somebody has like infective endocarditis, mitral, or involving the mitral valve or aortic valve, uh, a piece of the vegetation can dislodge and travel right to the brain. So, cardiogenic may be septic. The patient will have evidence of infection. We hear a murmur, there's a fever, leukocytosis that is basically hypotensive, and a piece of the clot, uh, a vegetation on the mitral valve or tricus, uh, aortic valve can travel right to the brain and lead to. A cardiogenic embol, septic embolus, right? Embolic stroke. 
aim and this will also lead to like brain abscess, right? Because the septic embolus has organisms in there, it is right, it can lead to brain abscess, not just a stroke, brain abscess as well. Then for aseptic cardiogenic uh, thrombus, that's where we're gonna we're gonna suspect this in patient with a feed. So a feed when or a flutter, so I'm gonna cardiac arrhythmias, SVT, that's a little what stasis of blood in the atrium. So clots can form in the atrium, typically the left atrium, and it's going to dislodge, trap and enter the left ventricle, pump into the aorta, go through the carotids or the vertebral artery, right, and end up in the uh, in the brain. It can cause that posterior circulation stroke or anterior stroke, right, whatever. And patient has that. So if I see a stroke, ischemic stroke in a patient with irregular, irregular heart rate, right, or ECG showing like SBT, things like that, it's going to be cardiogenic, right, thrombus from the heart. Also, heart failure and ventricular aneurysm can also cause cardiogenic embolic stroke. So in heart failure, the ventricles are dilated, they're not pumping as much, that will be stasis of blood in the heart. And aneurysm as well, ventricular aneurysm, maybe post-MI, is going to be right stasis of blood in the aneurysm. And the clot can dislodge right from there and end up in the brain. So that will be embolic, right? It's embolic stroke. Paradoxical stroke is a stroke I'm going to see in patients with DV, a stroke, ischemic stroke secondary to a DVT. So there is a deep vein thrombosis. Um, the legs are swollen. There's a demer. After maybe a long flight or risk factor, or after certain risk factor mobilization and stuff for DVT. And then instead of developing pulmonary embolism, right, as a result of the DVT, patient actually develop an ischemic stroke. I'm thinking there is a communication, right, between the, the uh, right side of the heart and the left side of the heart. Yeah, in that case. This can also happen with, um, you may also see this in uh, some sort of AVMs, right, AV fistula. So sometimes the patient has like DVT of the upper extremity as well. It can happen not just the lower extremity, uh, if the vein has a DVT in the upper extremity, the thrombosis in the upper extremity, right, and then it dislodges, ends up in the right heart, ends up in the brain. Or it dislodges, can travel from the vein into the arterial system, except like an artery, and then end up in the carotid or into the brachiocephalic artery, end up in the carotid, right? So, I also see these like AV fistulas in the like the upper extremity vessels or something like that. So, but you suspect this by see some DVT and then led to a stroke. And the patient has like ASD, PSD, or AV fistula, right? That led to the movement of the clot from the right side of the venous system, right? Into the left side of the heart, right? And then from there to the brain. We call this paradoxical, right? Uh, stroke. So that is gonna be embolic stroke. The other type of ischemic stroke would be what thrombotic stroke. Thrombotic. So you can see embolic stroke is due to pathologies outside, right? It's something outside the cardiovascular, the cerebrovascular system. Then the cloth travel to the cerebrovascular system, right? Either from the heart, DVT, whatever. But in thrombotic stroke, thrombotic stroke is when it's due to atherosclerosis. Right? Thrombotic stroke is due to atherosclerosis within the cerebrovascular system, within the carotid artery, within the cerebral artery, MCA, uh, um, MCA, ACA, PCA, the vertebral artery, right? The basilar artery, the cycle of Willis, anything, right? Any of those vessels that are primarily part of the cerebrovascular system, if there's a, an atheromatous plaque in those vessels, yeah. And we know atherosclerosis can form, right, due to, right, um, in patients with certain risk factors, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, patients that smoke, uh, patients with hyperlipidemia, patients with homocysteinuria, and some other, right, uh, risk factors. So the patient forms a, an atheromatous plaque in here. I mean, the plaque will be getting bigger and bigger, right? So depending. If the plaque is small, okay, it's leading to like 50% stenosis of like the carotids or cerebral artery, there'll be no problem. There's a lot of collateral circulation, right, in the cerebrovascular system. 
But if the plug keeps getting bigger and bigger and it gets to up to, up to like maybe 70% occlusion, then we're going to start getting worried. And especially if the patient's risk factor is not well controlled, the core of the plug will be becoming thicker and the cap, the cap will be, will be getting thinner. So the plaque start becoming unstable over time and becoming unstable and becoming unstable. Remember, imagine if this plaque is in the carotid, internal carotid artery, internal. So it starts becoming unstable, the curve gets bigger, the cap gets thinner. What will happen over time, eventually? The cap ruptures, you know, rupture. There will be like ostration of the cap, almost the same, almost like what happened in ACS, right? Same pathophys as uh, MI, STEMI and STEMI unstable angina. So the previously stable plaque will rupture, becomes unstable. It's going to rupture or become ostrated. So what happens to the core? The core becomes exposed to the what, platelets in the blood vessel. And then platelets will bind, of course, and they're going to form what? They're going to form a platelet cloth here. So if the clot, sometimes the clot can lead to 100% occlusion, right, like this, of the, maybe the cerebral artery, if it's, a, if it's a narrow artery, and that will lead to thrombotic ischemic stroke. Vertebral artery, thrombotic ischemic stroke in the brainstem. Yeah, or basilar artery, thrombotic ischemic strokes affecting the pump, something like that. But sometimes in the carotid artery, the thrombus can form like this, right? And then it's going to break off. A little bit will break off instead of, completely occluding the carotid artery, a little bit will break off and then it's going to travel. It's almost like thromboembolism, right? It's going to travel and eventually it's going to travel distally into the brain uh, until it's what lodges in the most distal part of the vessels and then occlude the vessel and it's a rough stroke, maybe cerebral stroke, MCA stroke, ACA stroke, right? PCA stroke, uh, if it's involving the vertebral artery, it's going to like PCA stroke, Brain stem stroke, things like that, yeah. So, but this is going to be thrombotic or thromboembolic, right? Stroke. So, atheromatous plug in the cerebrovascular system itself, vertebral artery, internal carotid, right? Cerebral arteries. And then the plug over time, if the risk factors are not well controlled, the plug over time becomes what unstable, it can rupture, and now it's what is superimposed, platelet thrombus formation. And that can lead to total occlusion of that artery to lead to an ischemic stroke. Or a piece of the thrombus can break off and it's going to travel distally, right? Thromboembolic and eventually occlude, right? A distal, uh, uh, narrowed uh, distal, right? Uh, a distal um, cerebrovascular vessel. So that is going to be thrombotic stroke. So the problem is not outside the system itself, it's within the cerebrovascular system. And these are the kind of, this is going to be part of the physiology of what is like most, uh, if it's, if it's non-embolic stroke, this is going to be a common part of it for a lot of strokes like MCA stroke, ACA stroke, vertebral artery stroke, TCA stroke, things like that. It's going to be thromboembolism or thrombotic stroke in patients with risk factors for atherosclerosis. Another type of ischemic stroke would be what lacuna impact. Lacuna impact. If you see ischemic stroke involving the deeper structures, deeper brain structures, thalamus, um, internal capsule, posterior limb, genu, anterior limb of the internal capsule, the deeper structures, it's going to be what? It's going to be due to atheriolosclerosis, not atherosclerosis. Arteriolo. So the lenticulostriate arteries, right, which are very, very arterioles now, they are very, very narrow arterioles that penetrate deep. They have like MCA branches and ACA branches. They penetrate deep into the brain and supply the dinosaur right? The internal capsule, the thalamus, etc. Yeah, these guys, they can undergo what we call atheriolosclerosis, hyaline atherosclerosis, which is different from atherosclerosis. Athero is what you're going to see in larger vessels, medium sized arteries, and stuff. In atherios, you're going to see atheriolosclerosis. In patients with chronic DM and hypertension, they can develop hyaline atheriolosclerosis. 
where I live, fibrinogen and fibrin will be deposited in the wall of the arterioles. So their wall becomes thicker, pinkish and thick, but the lumen becomes narrower until it's what total occlusion, which will lead to ischemia, right, of the deep brain structures. And then on imaging, like MRI or gross examination, you're going to see lacuna, like wells. Because anywhere the neurons die, right, or undergo necrosis, those areas, the neurons will be eventually, they're going to be eaten off and phagocytos, and that will leave what, like an empty space right in there. So you're going to see a lot of tiny, tiny empty spaces, right, in the deep brain structures, on like gross examination of the brain, but we, we call this lacuna, right, in bad. And the mechanism of those would be what higher lean arteriolosclerosis, right? Of the lenticulous triad, right? So different. Patient.